Okay, let's get back into this uh, synthetic intelligence and the transmutation of humankind, a roadmap to the singularity and beyond. Um, we're in chapter three about transhumanism. And we um, just got through with the first section of this introduction to transhumanism and the singularity. So scroll on down here to the next section, which is patented mind control technique. Something really interesting to look into is patents. When spending time researching them, astonishing patents can be found on the U.S. government internet patent site. The following is just one example among many. I urge the reader to go through the patent site to find more. They will be there. The following patent, which I will choose excerpts from, is patent number 6011991, dated January 4, 2000. In the abstract section, it says, quote, a system and method for enabling human beings to communicate by way of their monitored brain activity. The brain activity of an individual is monitored and transmitted to a remote location, e.g. by satellite. As at the remote location, the monitored brain activity is compared with pre-recorded normalized brain activity curves, waveforms, or patterns to determine if a match or substantial match is found. If such a match is found, then the computer at the remote location determines that the individual was attempting to communicate the word phrase or thought corresponding to the match stored normalized signal." End quote. And there is a footnote there. Here we have evidence that the MIC and the rest of the three letter agencies had the abilities to already in 2000 to monitor our brain frequencies. However, here is more from the same patent. Quote, it is another objective of this invention to provide a system capable of identifying particular nodes in an individual's brain, the firings of which affect characteristics such as appetite, hunger, thirst, communication skills, e.g. which nodes are utilized to communicate certain words such as yes, no, or phrases such as I don't know, I don't, I'm not sure or numbers such as 1, 2, 10, 100, and the like, thought processes, depression, and the like. When such nodes are identified, they may be specifically monitored by one or more sensors to analyze behavior or communication or words, phrases, or thoughts. In other embodiments, devices mounted to the person, e.g. underneath the scalp, may be energized in a predetermined manner or sequence to remotely cause particular identified brain nodes to be fired in order to cause a predetermined feeling or reaction in the individual, such as lack of hunger, lack of depression, lack of thirst, lack of aggression, lack of Alzheimer's disease effects, or the like." Un uh, end quote. It becomes evident that the MIC and others are using technology to monitor and then control our brainwave patterns, i.e. our thoughts and behavior. In line with that, we've discussed in previous chapters, we can see how this patent fits into the agenda of building the SBC that can monitor and control our brainwaves. There is really no way to dispute what is said in this patent, and as mentioned above, there is more of a similar sort. It is crucial that the AI agenda is exposed for what it is before it's too late because we're running out of time. We need to stop listening to talking heads on the news and AI prophets such as Ray Kurzweil. There is nothing benevolent in this movement and Kurzweil is lying when he's writing and saying that the singularity is a natural step in our evolution and that we will, because of the singularity, take a super leap in intelligence and unity as a new kind of human, super enhanced that becomes immortal through technology. And as a side note here, uh, this kind of 
tells me that some of these targeted individual plans or programs that they've that they're obviously using on people um, is not only with the cell towers but also um, probably with satellites I'm not sure it seems like nothing they can do uh, they can escape it but anyway uh, I, I don't have a clue anyway however at the same time they are actually wait a minute however at the same time they are actually dividing us by taking control of our thoughts and our minds thus being able to decide what the mass consciousness should think and experience therefore regardless of how we look at it it's the end of bo both individuality and unity Instead, we are getting a unified hive mentality and a hive community that is manipulated from the top. I am aware that the enthusiasts disagree with this. They are saying that the purpose is to strengthen the individual in a unified society. This sounds like a great utopia coming true, but let us rewind and take a look at history. And I am going to just keep going here in this next section. The Breakdown of the Family Unit The family unit has been a threat to the cosmic outlaws for centuries because it creates a strong bond between people. In the Middle Ages, the family unit was kept under control by having people live in poverty, filth, and starvation, while the rich were wallowing in money, luxury, and delicious food. Families stuck together but had little time to do anything except trying to cope with a situation where they live from day to day struggling to survive. With the Industrial Revolution and the new technological era, things changed. Regular people eventually received higher education in order to be able to understand and work with technology and the society that emerged from it. Also, the living standards slowly increased in the Western world, and the real poverty became rarer. The backside of this, viewed from the outlaw's perspective, was that the family unit also became stronger and healthier. People had more time to talk about things of concern, and it became harder for the manipulators to control families. The controllers had no idea what was happening behind locked doors. Consequently, something had to be done. One of the ideas was to int introduce television. The goal became one TV in every home. This was the fourth of many future steps to seduce the population with nonsense, so that they, instead of sitting around the table discussing subjects that could challenge the status quo, would be distracted and separated by watching TV. The first step to distract people was silent movies, the second step was radio, and the third step was movies that included audio. As a result, people who did not go to the theater or listen to the radio could bring the theater into their own homes. By distracting people often with nonsense programs, such as dubious western movies that distorted the actual history of the Wild West, TV series, subtle propaganda films, and biased and controlled news programs, they could more easily dumb down both the individual and the family unit. <clears throat> This worked like a charm for many years, and still does to an extent, but the AIF still felt threatened. Therefore, they wanted to create an experiment to see how solid their manipulation and mind control of the masses really was. Hence, they created the counterculture movement, which originated at the Tavistock Institute in the UK. The Vietnam War had started and now the controllers and their minions thought it might be a good idea to target the kids. Hence the hippie movement was created. It all started with Elvis Presley, who was succeeded by the Beatles and the Rolling Stones, upon whom a large number of other pop and rock groups, as well as individual singers and songwriters, followed. The entire purpose with pop and rock music was, and still is, to manipulate the teenagers. Part of the agenda in the 1960s was to alienate the children from their families by indoctrinating them and introducing them to drugs. Woodstock and other huge rock concerts had one major purpose, to drug down the hippie generation. 
At Woodstock, drugs were used openly, and the police were instructed not to intervene. What a stunningly great number of the musicians of the hippie generation had in common was that they were children of high-ranking military families. Many of these young musicians had been subjected to trauma-based mind control and had developed multiple personalities. Jim Morrison of The Doors is just one of the many examples. Charles Manson, another mind-controlled puppet, together with his equally mind-controlled gang of fanatic murderers, put a nail in the coffin of the hippie movement and from then on society became more violent and unstable, while heavy metal bands such as Alice Cooper and Black Sabbath with their tuned down guitar music, be being examples of forerunners of music groups who are spreading music with dark and often violent messages. These new bands now became the role models for a new generation. Alice Cooper, his real name is Vincent Fernier, said in an interview that he and his band were those who actually put the final nail in the coffin of the hippie movement. Most hippies were now in their late 20s or early 30s and some of them succumbed to drugs while others cut their hair, married, and got a job. The Tavistock-Woodstock experiment had been successful and the previous stability of the family unit began to show some serious instability after having lost almost an entire generation to war, rock music, drugs, and promiscuous sex. Nonetheless, something more had to be done to once and for all break families apart, and the Rockefeller Foundation was put in charge to accomplish this. They came up with a brilliant solution that also looked humane and fair on the surface, but its real purpose was to split the dangerous family unit and to more or less pull it up by its roots. The Rockefellers instigated and sponsored the women's liberation movement, Women's Lib, in the early 1970s. They planted some mind control charismatic women on the stage and these puppets were proponents for women to have equal rights to men. This of course was a new concept in this male dominant world and could have been a good thing if it wasn't for the real purpose behind the movement. The idea was that women should have an equal right to full-time jobs as men and to have equal opportunities to advance within the societal structure. The agenda was a success. Women entered the job market in much larger numbers than ever before and they now had their own careers to think about. Then of course they also wanted to marry and have children. This became a problem to a certain degree because how would they be able to combine their careers with raising children? The answer was simple. Daycare. These daycare centers took care of and raised the children while both their parents were busy working long hours. Also, society now had the opportunity to indoctrinate the children at an early age by taking charge of their early education, or read indoctrination. Now, finally, the family unit was split up. The societal structure the Rockefeller Foundation created and sponsored has now became the norm. Before women's lib, parents usually raised children who were happy and who, because their childhood was peaceful, had a stable ground on which they could go out and face the world as young adults. This was entirely based on the father who could support his entire family with his income while the mother could be a stay-at-home mom, taking care of the children and working around the house. This is the best environment for children to grow up in. This became next to impossible after the breakdown of the family unit. Suddenly the father, in general, couldn't financially support his family anymore when inflation made commodities much more expensive and income did not increase to match the upsurge in costs. Hence, regardless whether the mother wanted to work or not, she was forced to in order to be able to contribute to the overall finances of the family. In summary, the administrators and the overlords do not want us to unify on a spiritual level by our own means, a process that otherwise happens quite automatically when two or more people are able to connect on a deeper level, such as within solid and stable families. Since time immemorial, 
the outlaws have worked hard to keep us separated from each other on a spiritual level. Today it is worse than ever. Both parents work, the children are brought up by strangers, when what they actually need are their real parents, who can give them solid guidelines on how to behave as children and how to best succeed as adults. Instead, the children are being purposely indoctrinated by society from a very early age. Then when the real parents pick up their children from daycare after work, they are usually so exhausted after a stressful work day that they have little energy left to take care of their children's needs. What this creates are unstable children with anxiety, depression, and low self-esteem. When these children grow up, they are easily further manipulated by society and they often become obedient workers for the system. It's utterly important to have a stable and loving childhood to fall back upon when challenges in life are getting the best of us. Note also that I don't imply that women should be exempted from having a career if they want to. Moreover, I think it's important that a couple contemplate this important issue with the above in mind before they dedicate themselves mindlessly to a very stressful job market, leaving the main responsibility of childcare to others, who have no connection to the family. I know it's hard to manage on one person's wages these days, but we don't need fancy houses, expensive cars, and increasing credit card debt in order to have a good life. Less can sometimes be sufficient to survive and maintain a healthy work-life balance. It's important for the overlords to pr program us from our early childhood because that will format our way of thinking later in life. Instead, if sound and intuitive parents educate their children from the beginning by giving their, them their love and their time, great moral and ethical values, and teach them how to survive on their own, but also teach them how to problem solve, to help out at home in order for them to learn how to function in a family, and have them learn different skills based on the parents' experience and common sense, the children will become much more stable as adults. They will also be capable of critical thinking rather than being subjected to the indoctrination given in daycare centers and elsewhere, which only creates obedient slaves. Of course, there is always a chance that the parents are flawed and will teach their children destructive behaviors that they are passing forward from their parents, or they might abuse their children in different ways. But in general, the old way of raising children creates more capable and compassionate individuals. Separation makes people unhappy. We are a social species, and the controllers know this, of course. It's imperative for the controllers to separate us in order to unite us. The unification that the controllers want is unification through technology. And to make that happen, they must make humanity feel that it is in need of change. If a need for change is not created, no one wants to change. Having a sound family unit in place, few people would like the changes proposed by those in charge. However, after having separated us from each other, and made us overstressed and unhappy, we are crying out for a change that offers protection and guidance. It's the controller's formula all over again, problem, reaction, solution. Transhumanism is a way to further tighten the ropes around our necks, while presenting it as something positive by pointing out key things that are desirable to people, such as immortality, because most people are afraid to die. They are afraid of the unknown, and they don't want to leave their loved ones behind. With the singularity in place, that won't happen, or deaths will at least be very rare and far between. People get what they want, unity, and the overlords get what they want, synthetic artificial unity, created with technology. Then the new trap closes around people who are turning into immortal cyborgs who can't escape. They are stuck with rejuvenating artificial bodies that never die or deteriorate because everything in their bodies can be replaced and eventually be self-healing. It's just a matter of reorganizing the manufactured cells, nanobots, in the, body, in the body, and new limbs and organs can easily heal, 
or rather self-rejuvenate. People will be stuck for an eternity, figuratively speaking, in cyborg bodies in service to and as part of Lucifer's legions. If this is not threatening to us, I don't know what is. It is the same as the definition of nightmare or hell to me. Fortunately, there is a solution, which I will come to later. Alright, um, read that word for word, but <clears throat> just wanted to make sure that I didn't add a lot to that. But um, there's just so much, th so many things that come to mind about the state of society today. I mean, it's just ridiculous, really, if you're um, anywhere near my age anyway and have seen the slide of uh, just society. I mean, it's really hard to imagine it getting much worse, but I got a feeling that it can get a lot of a lot worse. Um, but anyway, <clears throat> that's all for this section. And uh, next we'll pick up on the United Nations role in transhumanism. So uh, we'll pick up there next time. Talk to you later.